This is the uh, Sheridan Suspension Test 3. We're going to, there's some, you're just going to keep your answers out there. You're also going to hand that along with that that you can keep for, for doing your finals in case you did the question, turn up on your finals, hang on to those. Um, or at least hang on to the part of it you can that's not printed on the back of the test page. Uh, you got electronic alignment equipment, and this is basically just a little graphic of the, the way it looks. To begin with, on our alignment machine over here, I and mean, I always have to hammer on this, the cameras will be confused if you don't keep the doors down. I got the windows blacked out on the two doors that are over there by the alignment machine. If you try to do an alignment with the doors up, you're not going to get good reading, so make sure you got the doors down, okay? Also, when you pull the vehicle up there, and some of you have been through this already, uh, these, uh, if you got a really long vehicle, you can actually take some of those dummy pads out of the way and move your turn plates, you know, farther toward the front. They're actually movable. You can you know, move the pad, they're heavy. You know, don't drop them, they cost like $500 a piece, you know, we don't need to bust them or anything. The long and short of it is you're going to pull the vehicle up there and you're going to make sure that it's straight on the lift and it is as centered as you can get it. And if you have to help somebody, you know, have somebody help you guide it on. Get used to pulling them up on there by yourself though because when you're at a shop somewhere, they're not going to want to have to guide you on there with every, you know, if, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you get your buddy to do this, but sometimes they may not be there and you don't have to sit around twiddling your thumbs waiting for somebody to say, you know, show you how to get on the lift. So get used to Hang, what you do is you open the door a little bit and you hang out the door so you can see the wheels. And I usually go up there if I'm not familiar with a particular vehicle and I just start up on the ramps and then I get out and I look and I say, you know, am I really close on one side and really far on the other side? And then I basically center it up on that. Stop just sort of the short of the turn pads. You still got the pins in the turn pads that keep them from moving. You know, the last person that did a front end alignment over there didn't put the pins back in the turn pads. And I tell you what's really bad is when somebody pulls a front wheel drive vehicle up on the lift and they park those uh, wheels on those turn pads and then whenever they get ready to leave, the rear, the rear wheel drive vehicle tries to dig out on the turn pads and they go clang, you know. <laughs> you can just see how destructive that is. So basically what you're supposed to do is get the car up there, use your wheel chocks, leave it in neutral. And you know, without the engine running or anything, and so you and just grab the wheels and roll it onto the turn pads. You know, the turn pads being the part that I'll show you in a minute. And then when you get through, roll it back off the turn pads the same way. Put your pins in before you ever get the car off the lift. If you do that, you know, the same way every time. Secondly, when you raise that lift up, make sure when you raise the lift up, it goes clink, 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 clink. And, and the, the one on the uh, right front corner is the highest one. So if you go up and you don't quite get above the one on the right front corner and then you go to lower it on the lock, what you'll wind up with is a car trying to go down on that corner because it's not a lock. But I always set it on the lock so it'll be level. But if it's not level, you won't get good readings either. So close the doors, care, be careful with my turn plates, and watch out for uh, making sure that it's level whenever you do your work. Uh, you got information on a computer screen, and you've seen this over there. Like, uh, they allow the technician to input the vehicle make model a year to obtain alignment. Has everybody done that? Has anybody here not done that? All right, perform will alignment to head on out compensation. Well, that one over there, now, you know, the diehard front end people will always run out compensate, and we really should. And it's not really that hard to do. On this particular one, you roll it backwards 45 degrees when it tells you to, level and level your sensors. Don't lock them yet, but just level them. And then hit OK, and then roll it back forward, level them again, and then lock them. And basically, you've done run-out compensation on all four wheels at the same time. You don't have to raise the car up off the wheels to do run-out compensation. How many of you have seen the big hunter machines that's got the paddles? You know, they actually put the thing, up. there's four paddles that are, gosh, they're this big around. And then there's this T thing up there that's got cameras that are looking at all of those paddles. And the way that you run-out compensate those is you roll it back and forth. And each paddle's got little, you know, phased array uh, stuff on it. The long and short of it, this one will do that too. It will do run out compensation by rolling it backwards 45 degrees and rolling it forward 45 degrees. Uh, you measure your caster, your camera, and your toe. You provide a target that allows the technician to zero in on specifications while making adjustments. That's when you're putting it in the green, right? Okay. So let's go on over here. All right, there's a lot of alignment systems available. Inclinometers to measure caster, camera, and steering axis inclination. Now, why do we want to measure steering axis inclination if it's not adjustable?
What if you're working on a car that looks really good, but somebody's crashed it somewhere back up the line, and the people that did the work on it didn't use their frame straightener right, or there's something they didn't fix, they just made it look good, but you got a problem with the way that it drives, and you're trying to figure everything out. Well, your steering axis inclination, now, there is a spec for that, but you can't adjust it. Now, Billy Bob at the body shop with his big, massive uh, frame straightening machine, you know, the uh, Continental Frame Straightener, he can pull stuff in shape, or you may have to replace some parts under there. Also, on this car like this white Taurus, it's got to have the transmission pulled out of it. There is actually, there are, on the H frame, there's some holes that you're actually supposed to stick pins, you know, tight fitting pins through before you put the bolts in to hold the carriage up. That will make sure that you don't have an alignment problem because you bolted the engine cradle up under it. You'll see the part of the front suspension is made under the engine cradle. So if you put it on there out of place, you're going to have alignment problems because of that. So you can basically look up under there and find those holes as we're supposed to locate that engine cradle exactly where it's supposed to be. You know, and you can tell if they're lined up or not. If they're not and you've got alignment problems, you got to loosen those four bolts that hold the engine cradle, line that up, you know, with your alignment pins, lock it back in. A lot of times we don't even think about that. Well, laser beams, is there a question that talks about this on your uh, picture? Uh, alignment system use inclinometers to measure caster, camera caster and steering axis inclination. Laser beams are reflective lights to measure total wheelbase and thrust angle. Regardless of the particular alignment system, alignment principles always stay the same. The knowledge gained from using one type of alignment rack can be transferred to others. See, so we got, the, we got this one over here. It's not that old. It's a pretty smart rack. Modern alignment equipment uses a computer, which is what we got over there. It's a Dell computer that looks just like one of those. Interestingly enough, though, even though it's just like one of those computers, and it's a Dell computer with a service tag number on it, there's no service help from Dell on the computer in that alignment machine. None. And the, the there's little USB uh, receivers that plug in that talk to those four heads on that thing and all that. But it looks just like that if you look at the computer. But you know, when it got here, that stupid thing, the disc, the optical drive was no good when it when it when it came. And so uh, we have to actually, when we do software updates, we got to put them on a jump drive yeah. with another computer. But anyway, uh, the, the information that can be stored, and you can actually print out alignment uh, information on that. Uh, the people, that, look, I colored this, this pretty in it, see? I did put that in paint, and I just made it nice and cute, and put, made it sort of, I made the rat blue, which is kind of like our out there and all that. The electronic sensors, you notice, why is this like that? Why is that at such an angle as that? Because of the fender. There's it's got to be able to see, it. doesn't it? Okay, how many of you guys have run into a situation where it couldn't see the sensor on the other side? Occasionally, you may have a a splash shield or something, or one of these uh, underneath air shields, or whatever you call them, that's messed up and sort of hanging down, and it blocks the sensor where you can't see it from one side to the other. Now, you better find, you either take that thing off, get it out of your way. Some of these vehicles, the vehicle sets so doggone low that the sensor can't see. I mean, the, the two front ones, you can get line of sight, look and tell if that sensor is partially obscured. Because when you're doing caster sweep, you know, they're going to do this. And if they go out of sight, they can't get to where they can't see each other, it's all of a sudden going to, you know, your screen's going to go dark. But what you can do, if you want to go ahead and get the most benefit that you can out of letting these things see each other, block the beam with your hand. It'll throw a prompt up on the screen. And you can, one of the, you know, you got some choices here. You can lower it a certain number of millimeters. If you say, I want to lower this 45 millimeters or 75 millimeters or whatever. So whenever you click that, then you got to go back and re-level your sensor, but it has changed everything so that when you put those things level and lock them, now this thing right here is lower. And it can see under all of that hot wash. You understand what I'm saying? There is, but if you want to do that, all you got to do is block the beam, you know, stand in there and block the beam with your hand. And it's going to have you level lower all four of them, that many millimeters. And all you have to do is go to your look at, you remember how you move the little screen to the little box level? It's going to change the, uh, you know, the Rubicon on that so that you're going to move it. And when you level it now, you'll notice that those arms aren't like this anymore. They're like that. And they can see under it. So they've actually thought that out pretty good. And these actually are pretty long arms, so they'll see about some pretty fat tires too. 
Occasionally, you'll have tires that are so gigantic and so fat that when you start trying to do a caster sweep, these things will lose sight of each other. You know, and that's irritating too. But anyway, everybody has seen this thing, right? Now, let me tell you something. When you're setting toe, when you're setting toe, let's make darn sure to begin with that this wheel is right in the center and that it's not bound up. It needs to want to be in the center. You know, if you pull the thing and it's got some tension on it and you put that thing in there, yeah, it's in the center, but it really doesn't want to be. Like if you move this thing out of here and the wheel goes, moves a little bit. I have seen people not do their homework on this. You know, you get up in there and you sit in a car and you sort of jiggle it back and forth till it finds the place where it wants to be and that's in the center. Then you put this steering wheel holder under it. And I like this one, it's made like this one. I don't like that other one. But for some reason, I need to find the one that's made like this one because I think somebody left it in a car or something. You know, because didn't remember the other day so did somebody couldn't find it? Somebody was over here trying to find, huh? Was that you? Maybe the alligator got there or something. Okay, so anyway, that thing, we got a, that bare steering wheel holder. I got another steering wheel holder. It works. We can use it if we need to, but I'd like to know where this one got off to. You know. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, you're going to lock that when you get this centered up like it's supposed to be. Now you can set your toe or where it's perfect and in the green and won't wear the tires out and have the steering wheel like this. And that's not good. And I've seen people do all of this work to do their alignment. You know, I fell in the trap once or twice myself. And you say, okay, we're, we're good. So you take all your sensors off, you head down the road, it drives straight down the road, everything's beautiful except your steering wheel is off. And customers don't accept this. They don't want their steering wheel to be like that. They want it straight so they can look, you know, so it looks right when you're driving down the road. They don't want to drive down the road with crooked steering wheels. All right, so long and short of it, be really careful about that to make sure. And the way that I like to do it is after I've already set everything, while the same sensors are still hanging, I like to get up here on my step stool and reach in the wheel and turn the wheel back and forth and then bring it back so that the machine says it's in the center and see if it's in the center. Because if it's not, if it's crooked and it's saying it's in the center there, that's what you're going to see going down the road. You're going to see it crooked a bit. So just be really careful about that. This is not really a big deal. All right. I don't know who this is. Hello. Hey Gretchen, how are you doing, sweetie? Oh, we're in school. What do you need done? Uh, is it a bug? Is it a newer one of the new Beatles? Uh, one of six. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I got one guy doing engine repair, and uh, he's already got another bug ahead of you. He's probably going to have a head gasket put on it, and so, you know. So, but anyway. But uh, we can actually see where the coolant's going, though we might be able to fix it quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're good people. A leak where? What, uh, what was leaking you cut out? Well, we'll just do a pressure test on it and see what we can see. You know, bring it on, bring it on over here. We'll see what we can do. We, it may be a little bit before we can get to it, but we'll try. It. But, uh, all right. Yes, ma'am. Four thirty. That ought to that ought to do. It's piling up for you. You're getting all kinds of stuff piling. Looks like we eat up with Volkswagen this time for some reason. Anyway, this right here is the turn plates I was talking about. Sorry about that. Uh, See the little pins that I put in here? I, mean, I didn't draw this, I just colored it. But that turn plate right here is the part that we want to be careful that we, you know, it's basically what you're wanting to do, if you're doing a four wheel alignment, you got these great big massive plates on the back that's got pins you can pull that move freely. If you're making an alignment adjustment, you want the wheels to be able to float, right? You don't want them sitting on something so the rubber's, rubber's dragging on the dirt. And all that. Can you say rubber baby buggy bumpers really fast without messing it up? Rubber baby buggy bumpers. Huh? Can you do that? Can't do that, can you? You messed it up, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> Rubber baby buggy bumpers. Y'all be able to say that. But for some reason, nobody always stumbles over it. Okay. Turn off your program ride control before lifting the vehicle with air suspension. This is a little, I'm not charging anything extra for this. 
There's a switch in the trunk on the cars. If it's got a, if it's got air suspension and it's like an expedition, it'll be the ones that I know about. It'll be in front of your the passenger right foot. Uh, also, if somebody's changing a tire out beside the road and they're going to jack the car up, you don't want the air suspension trying to correct for a ride hat for a perceived ride hat change that you've made while jacking it up. You know why that's a problem. You know what happens when you raise it up on the lift without turning off the air suspension? Anybody ever seen that happen in here? We got one of the state cars that's got air suspension on it. What happens is you don't turn off the air suspension, you raise it up, and the right height sensor says, oh my gosh, we're sitting way too high. I'm letting all the air out of the bags. So it lets all the air out of the bags. And when you set it down, it squats down on the lift, and you can't get the lift out from under it. <laughs> Until the air compressor pump you know, fires up and it raises it back up. And that's sort of embarrassing, you know, because all your buddies go, whoa, you know. <laughs> but I mean, pay attention to whether it's got airbag suspension. If you switch on that key and you see an air suspension light, you better be finding that switch. If it's in the inside the vehicle in front of the driver's right foot on an SUV, or if it's back there in the back in the trunk, open it up. It's going to look like that. It'll be on the left side in a Crown Victoria or a Lincoln, you know. And, but in the uh, in the other ones, it's too big to get or just flip it off, you know. And so we actually, when we have one of these. It's older and starts giving trouble with air suspension and they're leaking down and cutting up. It's just a whole lot smarter on the older ones to buy the kit that comes with shocks and springs and convert it to regular suspension and then set that ride height sensor where it's supposed to be so that you never see that light again. You got me? And it's, it's just smarter to do it that way. Because how many of you see them riding around squatting down? You can fix that. It ain't really that hard to do. But, uh, that's pretty much the end of that. So everybody knows all the answers to that uh, testament. Can you draw? An illustration of what steering axis inclination is. Somebody draw it. You got it? That looks pretty doggone good there. No copy in nobody's paper. You got to draw it. From memory, what steering axis, axis inclination, I need to see it. And I'm going to take my camera around here and show you drawing it. And uh, this will all go on YouTube. Actually, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but, but you do need to know. I told you last week, you better be able to draw this. Then remember that? Can you draw steering axis inclination? Huh? What's that look like again? Huh? What's that look like again? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can find it here. I had that last time around. I don't know where it is. That's it. I can't find it. It's over. Hey, I was trying to help y'all. You know? That's not it. Steering axis inclination. Does somebody need to draw it on the board? Huh? Then draw it on board. Let's see if we can not look at the my phone in my pocket or anything. Okay, you got that? All right, let me see if I can find a marker. Watch this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Define steering axis. Somebody tell me what steering axis is. <laughs> Anything that turns turns on an axis, doesn't it? You know what the the angle of steering axis, I mean of axis inclination of the earth is? 23 degrees. Huh? 23 degrees. 23 and a half degrees, same as Mars. They're both the same. Okay, uh, the last time I measured Mars, it was 23 and a half. Okay, now what we're going to do here is we're going to have a tire right here. I've also got a, a presentation we do on tires a little bit later. That's the vertical of the tire, right? Okay, now, what do you have here and here? Upper ball joint, lower ball joint. This right here is the steering axis. All right, now if you've got a McPherson strut, you're gonna have spring there, and you'll usually just have a lower ball joint. You won't have an upper ball joint, you'll have a lower ball joint. If you've got short long arm suspension, you're gonna have your upper A-frame here and your lower A-frame here, and the relationship from straight vertical to that steering axis is going to be your steering axis inclination. And they're talking about to the inside. Now, why do they put it at that angle? You ever wonder about that? Think of yourself as an engineer. You put it at an angle, why? Whenever I was piddling around doing some car home carpenter work, you know, my dad had a sawmill, so I had endless supplies of lumber. And I had a planer and a table saw and all that kind of stuff. And I built a table, a little table, you know, not very big, with straight legs. 
But the only problem is it was kind of not as stable as one with legs that were splayed. If you've got legs that are splayed, like on a chair particularly, then it's going to be harder to turn that chair over. That makes sense to you? So if you splay them out, a car doesn't usually try to turn over from front to back unless it's in an action film, whenever they boom, they blow it over. But on the, when it's going side to side, that and increases the stability of the car when the steering axis is in because it's sort of like, you know what I mean? Like if you're, if you don't, if you're standing and you don't want to be pushed over sideways, you're going to put your legs farther apart than your shoulders, right? And that way it's going to make you harder to turn over. Somebody pushes you, you got, you know, that you're being shored up because of the angles of your legs. But that's why these things are like that. If it's spread, spread out a little bit like that, it's, it makes it more stable. Got it? I've never heard anybody teach that before, but that's the only reason that's there. You know what I mean? So anyway, that should take care of everything that you need to know for today.